and uh, we'll see how we do. The first five minutes or so, I'm just gonna ask folks to work on their reflections and I've got the link here, I'm gonna uh, put it in there. All right, we're already getting some folks joining. It's nice. So, Yeah, so um, we have a panelist chat, so we can uh, um, give ourselves hints and whatnot if we need to. Um, and then there's also a way to write to the um, to all the attendees as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, folks, looks like there's about ten of you on so far. Um, I hope that. Um, the day went well. Um, we um, are going to uh, start in a few minutes, but I'd like you to spend the next couple of minutes, if you can, to fill out the reflection form for the day. I, I sent, I put the uh, the link in the po in the in the chat. So um, I go ahead and, and spend a couple of minutes on that, and we'll uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. <clears throat> So Tianming, where, where are you located? I'm at Shanghai Institute of Neuroscience. Okay. Sure. Nice. So uh, we really have a global coverage with the with yeah. panelists this morning <laughs> slash evening slash afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's nice. So what time is it? In England right now, Lawrence. Uh, it's seven a.m. Yeah, seven a.m. It's, oh, it's so a quiet it's part of, of, of a day before my my one year old wakes up, so it's uh, it's quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just one more time, folks. I put the link for the reflections form in the chat. So please, um, please uh, take a minute or two to fill that out, and we'll get started here in just a second. Sean, do people put the questions in the Q and A? Or just a Q and A yeah, button? That's the idea, uh, and we're 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 typically encouraging them to do that until after they've filled out their reflections. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll get some questions in the Q and A, and um, I think we'll start with a quick uh, round of intros. Um, I might, you know, still wait another minute or two for that. Um, sure. So uh, looks like a few more folks have joined. So check out the um, the reflections forum. The link is in the chat. Um, and then we can get down to business. Mm -hmm. So a couple more people join. The, the link for the reflections form is in the chat. If you guys can uh, um, work on that for another minute and, and then we'll get started. Question. Oh, nice. Hmm. 
Okay, so why don't we, um, while folks are still finishing out that reflections form, um, why don't we start with the round of introductions? Mm -hmm. And um, maybe, um, maybe I'll kick it off. Um, so um, my name is Shauna Scola. Um, I'm uh, an assistant professor uh, at Columbia University in New York um, in, the, the, um, in the theory center there. Um, I am also one of the organizers for NMA. I'm, I'm uh, one of the uh, board members and founders. And as hopefully you know, I was also the lecture, one of the lecturers today this, for this morning's lecture. Um, and uh, I'm interested in, uh, in, in hidden states uh, in, and the, sort of the states of neural networks in general um, and how you can switch between states. Um, and what the neural mechanisms of that, uh, that, that is. Um, and I'm also interested in the data analysis piece, piece which was more of the focus today. So um, I was excited to have the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you guys today. And I'm having, excited to, to be the, 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 on the panel this, this, uh, at the end of the day today as well. So uh, Pascal, you wanna, you wanna go next? Uh, briefly, all right. So my, hey, thanks for joining us. My name is Pascal Wallish. I, uh, I'm on the faculty uh, at the Department of Psychology here at NYU. I'm a clinical associate professor. I'm also teaching a Cold Spring Harbor neural data science class every other year. We taught it last year. We're be probably not gonna teach it next year because of the coronavirus, we'll see. And um, yeah, I'm also interested in, um, in inferring, um, uh, you know, uh, states from data, how to deal with uncertainty, things like that. Can you hear me loud and clear? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, um, that's pretty much it uh, for this purpose. And well, and Pascal was also the, um, the 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 head of the day, if you will. Yeah. Right? The, right, I guess so. Yeah, so we have him to thank. Great. <laughs> Tian Ming. Hi, my name is Tian Ming, and uh, it looks like I'm the only one who is um, hosting the normal working hour right now. Uh, I'm at the Institute of Neuroscience here in Shanghai, China. And, uh, and we study decision-making and cognition in our lab. We train monkeys uh, to do a variety of decision-making studies, um, trying to link neural activities in the brain to the behavior to understand the computation underlying the decision-making process. We are particularly interested in how information is integrated during decision-making. Uh, information not only just about perception or sensor inputs, but also regarding um, value and other things related to decision making. Uh, we, we like to know how value is computed and represented in the brain and how value is used in decision making and uh, how and how other cognitive processes such as attention may affect decision making. All right. And, uh, Thanks for that. And, and Lawrence, you want to um, finish us off? Yeah. Uh, so my name's uh, Lawrence Hunt. I'm uh, a Henry Dale um, fellow here at the University of Oxford. Um, I'm pretty similar to Tian Ming in that uh, I um, uh, study the, the neural basis of um, decision making in a range of tasks that involve kind of integration of evidence across time, particularly from the reward-based reward and value-based um, uh, end of, of things as opposed to perceptual decision making. Um, and I've, I've done so uh, to some extent in uh, macaque monkeys as, as Tian Ming does, but primarily I now do this in, uh, in human neuroimaging data. So using a mixture of functional MRI uh, and MEG and using some of the models that were discussed uh, today to, to um, interpret some of that data. Great. So um, I'm going to make one final appeal um, to folks to make sure that you fill out the reflections form, which is that the link is in the, in the chat. Um, and, um, and why don't we um, kick it off? So we have one question um, that's uh, come up here. Um, uh, and um, the question is, in the sequential prob probability ratio test, why do we calculate the, li the likelihood ratio of um, the, the, the data points uh, under the two different models instead of the posterior probability ratio. 
um, where, um, and so, you know, I, I wonder if, 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 if any of you want to um, give that one, a, take a swing at that one. I'll also, maybe I'll just make one more point, which is that this was the first question. It's a very technical question. We are going to try to stay at a little bit of a higher level. Um, and, and, but, uh, you know, well, we can, we can start with this one for right now. Uh, maybe I can answer that question. Uh, I don't know if I should to click something on the screen or not. Or is, no, no, I can, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, mark it as answered. Uh, um, so. Okay. Yeah, so, oh, so I think there are two reasons. Well, um, well, first of all, it's relatively easy uh, to calculate the probability of uh, Px given h0 or h1. But secondly, when you are trying to combine this probability together, you would multiply them together, right? And, uh, and that requires you to have the condition item to be the same across these probabilities, right? So you can calculate the probability of x1 um, and x2 happen together in the hypothesis h1 by, uh, by multiplying um, px1 given h1 um, and px2 given h, h1. But you cannot do the opposite. You cannot calculate the probability of uh, x, uh, probability of h1 given x1, x2 by multiplying probability of h1 given x1 and probability of uh, uh, h1 given x2. So, um, so, uh, so mathematically, you just cannot do that. Uh, that's a reason we would do, uh, we would put the hypothesis as a condition instead of the, uh, uh, um, um, and uh, uh, and uh, it's actually easy to go back and forth using the Bayesian theory anyway. So I don't think that uh, uh, if you know either quantity, uh, yeah, so, uh, so I think if you know either quantity, it'll be easy for you to work out the math anyway. Great, thank you. Um, I think we'll, um maybe do the next one next by Natasha. Um, so what are the optimal ways or are there optimal ways to remove and reduce the effect of noise when inferring states from data in the, in the, with the hidden Markov model? Um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll take a, a quick swing at that. So um, the idea, so I think what you're, you're asking is how do we have a sharper posterior distribution over the states given the data? I mean, in some ways, the, the whole point of the hidden Markov model is to be able to give you a um, sharper distribution than you might have if you don't take into account the dependencies of the states on each other from time point to time point. Um, so beyond that, the HMMs is designed to, to capture uh, as much certainty as you actually have. Um, uh, that is, of course, dependent on the assumptions that you build into the model. So if you make certain assumptions about the noise model, and then you get some data, your certainty over your, um, over your state estimations will reflect your assumptions as well as the, as the data that you collected. Um, and so you could have either too much certainty or not enough certainty um, over your inference depending on your choice of noise model and whether or not that was actually appropriate for the data that you collected. So I don't know that there is a good answer. Maybe one of my co-panelists here might have a better answer for how to optimally remove noise or the effect of noise when, it, when, when, when inferring states, other than to say you want to have the best model. So you want to try to pick your noise model as well as you can. And then you want to have the best data <laughs> so that you have the, less, the least noise you can have when you're making these inferences. I mean, if I can briefly jump in there, I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's fair to say that if you have bad data, uh, nothing, nothing will really help you get out of that, right? I mean, there's, there's no tricks, particularly if the noise is not, if you want to call it noise, not, not Gaussian, right? That's right. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have the right model. If the data is, is, uh, is really, really noisy, you're, you're stuck. But, um, if, the, if there is a possibility, if there's hope for doing inference, but you have the wrong noise model for whatever reason, 
um, that could hurt you. Um, or, it, and it could hurt you in one of two ways. It could hurt you by, you know, giving you poor inference, or it could also make you, you know, more certain than you should be. And that's maybe even worse. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's keep going here. Um, uh, how about um, this one from Andy, who is trying to understand um, the differences um, between uh, the linear dynamical system view that was presented in day three and how it uh, uh, refers to the view in day two um, and uh, um, and specifically is it is it somehow broader because in day three we take a, a latent variable um, view um, and also you know how does and then maybe there's a second half of the question maybe I'll hold off on that for now which is related to um, EM and common filtering. You guys see that question on, when, on your, mm -hmm. on your mm -hmm. So first of all, I, I guess I should caveat it that I don't know that any of the four of us have have a, a deeply studied the curriculum for day two. So um, um, so maybe I'll try my best to, to frame the questions. What does it mean to think about um, a linear dynamical system in the context of a latent model as opposed to an explicit model? Um, and, and, you know, do we have any, any thinking about that, that, that idea, that dichotomy? I mean, I, I, it seems to me that, that part of the issue is that, is that um, a lot of the time in neuroscience, you're working with data where there are things which uh, you can't observe directly. Um, and that are likely to be generating um, uh, transitions between different states that you um, uh, that, that you'd observe in in a, in a sequence of, of activity, um, and that's precisely what um, uh, the um, uh, HMM that was discussed today provides you with it provides you with a framework for being able to say well I think that there are some things which I'm going to be able to observe directly and there are some other things which I think are going to be uh, generating those data in sequences which um, uh, which uh, I'm not going to have direct access to but I'm going to be able to infer and by knowing by directly inferring the fact that they have conditional independence con conditional dependencies as as was kind of discussed in answer to the previous question um, then uh, that gives you a handle on 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 being able to to um, say with with some confidence exactly um, which state is your, your, the, the brain's likely to, to currently be in, and uh, and also give you some estimate of like what state transition matrix is between those different states, and that's something which I don't really see as as being there uh, in in the kind of linear dynamical systems that that um, were discussed in the previous day. But I don't know if that's uh, if you, you'd agree with that. Uh, Sean or other panelists. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the you know the in the in the setting of the common field. So the the underlying equations of a linear dynamical system are are the same, and and I, I I'm pretty sure that's what was covered in day two. Um, mm -hmm. But but related to what we were talking about before, there is this additional benefit of having this noise model on top of it that um, allows for additional flexibility. In fact, it's not. We didn't explicitly talk about this today, I don't think, but it's not necessarily wrong to use a common filter even if you know the system's not linear, right? If it's sort of close enough, you can actually pack some of the, the nonlinearity into your noise model. It's, it's, it's maybe not as optimal as, as picking a system that ex expressly um, deals with the nonlinearity, but it's not necessarily a bad modeling approach. And there are some times when you might want to do that. So, you know, maybe it's it's a richer framework, but at the end of the day, I mean, the, the equations are the same, right? The, the linear equation. I, I, guess, I guess it's richer in so far as it explicitly takes uncertainty into account, right? Both that the data is coming in over time, that they're going to be polluted by noise, that we basically use the data as shadows cast from the real objects in the latent space, right? I mean, it's like a platonic model, basically. <laughs> I like that. And I, I mean, no, right? Yeah, no, no, it makes, it makes sense. I'll, I'll just uh, really quickly, so for the last part of the Andy's question. Um, oh, yes, yes, there's more. 
yeah, there's um, yeah. So e, so EM and and is uh, is a way to fit these models, and common filtering is one step of EM, mm -hmm. in for for common filters. Uh, so so I I don't think that we're going to spend more time on that in this uh, discussion because uh, I think that wasn't uh, the the main focus of the of the um, of the topics today. But um, Andy, if you have if you want to get deeper into that, you can find me on the uh, um, find find me somehow. I don't know how. <laughs> find me, send me an email. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, okay. So um, why don't we uh, go ahead and look at um, uh, uh, Yuan Chen's um, uh, question? In previous tutorials, we have covered um, dimensionality reduction, like PCA factor analysis, Gaussian process fa process factor analysis. What's the relationship between these and what we talked about today, linear dynamical systems? Is it just how the factors evolve during the time series? Do you want me to start this down? Sure, go for it. I, I mean, I think in practice, at least in my work, uh, what we often do is we take all these measures and we do the PCA or some other kind of dimension reduction first to then have s simpler or s uh, less variables, fewer variables to then track in some state space. W would you say that's fair? Anyone else on the panel? That's exactly what we do with, with uh, MEG data, uh, which we analyze with um, uh, the HMM as framework as, as well. So uh, we start with, with data that we've recorded um, at sort of several thousand um, mm -hmm. sources. Well, once you've, you've source reconstructed, you have data at several thousand sources, but then you project that into like 50 or so um, uh, smaller patches that are, that are governed by uh, principal components or independent components, and then perform an, an HMM on, on that data as well. So that's, um, uh, yeah, um, very much the same. Yeah, I think that's that's good. I, I, let's move on to um, uh, Qian Liang's question, which I think is actually a really interesting one. Um, so uh, she she asked about beliefs, or, or he. I, I really apologize um, if I if I make some some errors here. Um, uh, asked about beliefs in uh, with respect to the common filter and the hidden Markov model, um, and that they are mathematically defined as the posterior of these latent variables given some evidence. Um, and the uh, the question, so I'll just read this. So this is uh, normatively optimal when the task is to do a decision uh, to do decision based on the latent variables. However, the posterior is dynamically changing with the incurring evidence. How do we directly measure this belief from neural recordings? How can we prove that the brain is doing this normatively optimal approach? I, so my take on this question is, uh, how do you know? It, even if we have a a good model, like a state space model that tells us how you should behave given some uh, some model and some uncertain some data and some uncertainty, um, you know, how do we how do we have a sense that the brain is is behaving optimally or not, um, uh, according to a model like this. Do we want to take a stab at that? So I can, I can maybe just start with an idea. Um, so certainly in, in some simple settings, people try to do this, right? So, the um, sequential probability ratio test, which we, we framed today in the context of a hidden Markov model, it is a special case of a hidden Markov model. Um, you can also just think of that as, as a way to do optimal inference uh, of, of between two different possibilities um, when you're accumul accumulating evidence over time. And um, uh, in uh, uh, some classic experiments that have been done in uh, Mike Shadlin's lab and, and in the labs of others, now, um, people look at, uh, you know, uh, uh, integrating uh, sensory evidence over time to make a decision of whether or not there's some, in this, some noisy stimulus is, so in the, in, in the case of Mike's data, is it that these moving dots, are they more to the left or more to the right? Um, and, uh, and you just sort of, can, the, the, and animals can sort of watch these things and make a decision. You could do it too as a human, and there are other versions of it. Um, rats do this with clicks on the left and the right. But um, there are regions of the brain that you can record from that will show exactly the same kind of, um, of posterior, you know, um, 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 maximum posterior estimate 
that you would um, that you would expect to see if you're doing this kind of um, SPRT um, uh, evidence integration. So, uh, so that's maybe, sort of, yeah, it's maybe worth point, pointing out um, that Tian Ming, I think, did, did probably the most direct test of that sequential probability ratio test when he was working in in Mike's lab. I don't know if you if if it's worth just like telling them about uh, that experiment. Um, Right. <laughs> yeah, this is always hard to prove that the brain is actually doing something that you think the brain is supposed to do, right? So, so, so the usual approach is, uh, uh, is first you have some model, uh, you fit the model to the behavior, so so that you can so that you can extract some, um, you can extract some parameters from your model. Then you find the neural correlates. Uh, uh -huh. um, so, but but of course you can always argue whether these correlates really represent, uh, um, really mean that the brain is actually doing this calculation, uh, whether there is an implementation of the model in the brain or not. This is uh, this is very difficult to answer, and uh, and you have to look at it um, case by case, um, but. Uh, but my personal belief is, if the neural representation is uh, is is uh, is very clear, so for example, if the firing rate uh, or or um, or some simple linear combinations um, of firing rate relatively easy and to uh, easy to be implemented by a neural network. Uh, if you can find the neural correlates in this kind of uh, way uh, to your model, I would say this is a good uh, evidence. If you find some very convoluted neural representation of your model, like 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 if the uh, if the representation has uh, have to be extracted by a very complicated uh, uh, very complicated data analysis, uh, there is added level of or complexity by your data analysis itself, then then I was I would think this is less evidence for the brain is actually using your model to uh, uh, to solve the task. But yeah, uh, if I may jump in there, Sean. Yeah. So yeah, I would actually second that uh, just a correlation, no matter how sophisticated, doesn't establish anything. Uh, which I think uh, goes with the next question, Sean, with the uh, uh, closed loop thing. So I think what what you, by the way, just to be clear, you can never prove anything in a non-deductive system. So empirically, you can only gain evidence for or against. But I think what you were getting at before was the idea of causality, which goes with the next question, uh, Hui Seng's question, Sheng's question. The question is like uh, causality, if you close a loop. And I think I think in principle, uh, that's that's a great way to establish that what you're, what you have is real, that that this is driving the system. But in practice, since you asked about EEG versus TMS in practice, I don't think e either EEG or TMS is going to have the uh, spatial resolution in particular. It's going to have the temporal resolution, but not the spatial resolution to actually do this sufficiently well, I would say. That would be my prediction. I, th I, I, I think it maybe depends upon exactly what question you want to ask. So, so I, I guess there are some phenomena that are occurring at the level of, um, fair, fair. of macroscopic signals. So for instance, if you want to know causally, is one brain region involved in generating the alpha rhythm that you can measure at the, the scalp surface, then a combination of, of EEG and, and TMS might be a, a very good way of answering that. But if, on the other hand, you really want to ask, a, say, is a neural representation that is being measured in the parietal cortex a very reliable estimate of the sequential probability ratio test? And if I, uh, if I uh, go and stimulate those neurons. Does it cause a shift in the beliefs of belief of the animal? Then you're not really going to get to that that question with uh, EEG and TMS, but you you might well get there by doing some of the kind of optogenetics experiments that, that go on in the labs of places like but, Carlos Brody in Princeton right. now. EEG and TMS is also going to be limited in terms of the spatial distribution. For instance, um, as you saw in the video uh, with where Marion at end talked about uh, the uh, mood BMIs. I, I, I doubt the TMS would get down there. This is very superficial. Like the penetration of the magnetic field is only very superficial. So I would say, I would agree with Lawrence. Like uh, if it's like superficial layers per idle lobe, that's what your task is. Yeah, you could do that with TMS, but if it's deeper down um, limbic system and like that, uh, probably not, you would need to go deeper. 
some kind of like, uh, you know, optionality probe, as you said. Is that fair? Well, look, well thanks. Thanks for, uh, for giving feedback on that next question, guys. Um, why don't we um, go on uh, one more here to um, Masa, Masa's question. Um, would you compare drift diffusion models and markup? How would you compare drift, drift diffusion models and markup models? What does state mean in the drift diffusion model, and what does evidence mean in markup models? Anybody want to take a take a, a, a stab at that? So I, I think it's 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 in some ways very, very similar to um, uh, the the way the framing that was given in the tutorials today in the the um, sequential probability ratio test is a special case of a hidden Markov model in that the state stays constant across time. That assumption is also implicitly there in the kind of vanilla form of a drift diffusion model. Um, so in, in, in a drift diffusion model, you're, you're assuming that your state stays fixed over time. And the, um, the, the impact of evidence that occurs at any point in time um, to your belief um, will will you, you'll you'll have the same amount of impact on 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 your current belief by evidence that's received early in the trial versus evidence that, that's received late in the trial. That's that's not true for a, a hidden Markov model because more recent evidence is is much more informative for for whether you're currently in in one state uh, or another. There is an alternative, uh, a, a, a kind of a more general g g generic form of the a drift diffusion model that does take into account the possibility that the state might change over time. Um, and that's uh, called an ornstein ullenbeck process, uh, which is basically a, a drift diffusion model, but with a leak parameter. Um, so, so where um, the, uh, the, 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 the state of the, the, the decision variable over time kind of forgets past evidence and, uh, and remembers present evidence. And, uh, in tasks where you're, whether the, the, it's uncertain whether the state is constant over time or whether it's changing over time, the ornstein ullenbeck process turns out to be optimal uh, for, for inferring um, uh, uh, the fact that, that, that you're, you're, you're trying to work out both um, which state you're in and whether the state might be changing over the time. So there might be, uh, to some extent, some, some, some links that could be drawn between between that kind of model and the um, and the hidden Markov model. In, in an OU um, process, I guess there's no explicit modeling of the um, of any sort of switching dynamics. There's just a a, a forgetting um, time scale that's yeah. built in. Isn't yeah. That right? So exactly. Yeah. 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 But the, I think there was there, there there have been some papers which have tried to draw uh, links. Um, and, and said that under certain assumptions that the, the OU process would, would still be optimal even in a task that has switching states. I see. Interesting. Yeah, I think the simplest diffusion model is actually just Markov model because your current state, like, like how much information has been integrated, um, uh, does not depend on how you get there, right? Uh, uh, in the most simple case of diffusion model. And, uh, and actually, that can be solved with the Markov model method. Uh, and uh, but uh, but uh, but if you want to take account into some time variant uh, time variant signal, for example, like like urgency signal, then it does matter uh, how you get to that state. Then you need to uh, have more complicated model. Cool. Thanks for the. The nuance. Um, all right, let's go to um, Zishan's question. Is there potentially a cost function associated with the speed accuracy trade-off in decision-making? For example, someone opti optimizing speed over accuracy in a decision is more likely when the cost is low. Um, is there, uh, have people been working on this question? Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, it's a great question. I mean, some people have argued that the whole point of the brain is to act better uh, than you would otherwise. By the way, just to be clear, there's plenty of organisms that don't have a brain or nervous system that they, they, they do just fine. So, so the point of the brain is to do better. And in m many real life situations, uh, better behavior, better decisions simply means um, acting faster. 
Uh, I'm sure you saw Star Wars. I know we were told not to use cultural reference, but maybe you saw that Han Solo shooting first. There's a lot of research on duels. Whoever shoots first usually wins. So often a better decision is a faster decision in, in practice. And just to be clear, uh, those organisms that, that don't have a brain that make decisions, slime molds make decisions, they find you know, food sources, they do great. They can optimize, they can solve the travel salesman problem, all kinds of stuff. So you don't need a brain, but to make a better decision, you do need one. And like I said, often um, acting better means acting faster. So yes, there's extensive research on the speed accuracy trade-offs, tra accuracy trade-off in almost all decision-making tasks. You need to basically account for that in your data. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure what else to say. There's tons and tons of research on that. Uh, it's been uh, studied extensively. Lawrence. I guess a, a good thing to think about in terms of what you're, what, or something that's often thought about in terms of what you're trying to optimize is that you're not necessarily just trying to optimize how fast you are or how accurate, accurate you are on a single trial, but you might be trying to optimize your performance over the course of the experiment as a whole. Um, and so you might be able to frame that speed accuracy trade-off in terms of say your average reward rate across the experiment as a whole rather than just um, on, on a single set of trials. And that can tell you kind of whereabouts the optimal threshold should be, because obviously there's a, there's a cost for waiting forever and carrying on accumulating evidence, even though you're going to become more and more accurate on your current decision, you're also going to be extremely slow in terms of getting to reward and getting onto the next decision and where there might be more reward available and it might be an easier decision as, as well. So, Lawrence, uh, so I have a, a follow-up question, um, just thinking about Zishan's question a bit more. So imagine you have a trial design, a, a, a experimental setup design where the, tr the inter-trial intervals are fixed. So your maximum amount of a reward over a whole session is fixed. Um, in that scenario, um, the optimal thing would be to sort of be as slow as, you know, makes sense within the context of the trial to make sure you never make an error. But we still see sort of a speed accuracy trade-off even in that scenario, right? So, how do we th how do we think about that? We still uh, see that actually has been studied. Um, so um, so uh, so there's a cost associated with the decision making process, right? When you are, when you're making decisions, your brain is act, uh, uh, your brain is actively computing it's, things, it's and the that's thinking the cost. So, yeah. So so you don't want to wait forever uh, to reach that perfect decision, and. Uh, and uh, and actually, in the real biological system, it's very hard to uh, hard to find out what the brain is trying to optimize. Uh, people have been uh, um, making hypotheses. For example, maybe it's a reward rate, as Lawrence just said. In the long term, how much, uh, how fast you can get reward. Um, but people have also found out that uh, for monkeys. Uh, for many monkeys, they found that uh, uh, that uh, that when they calculate a rewarding rate, uh, actually monkeys don't care as much about the intertrial interval, meaning that uh, uh, they are optimizing the rewarding rate, but um, uh, but after removing the intertrial interval, as if uh, uh, there's no cost related to the intertrial interval, those kind of things. Yeah. So yes. So I guess my point is that uh, that it's hard to determine what real brain is trying to optimize, and you have to get that from the experiments first. Then, then, uh, then you can model this, trying to establish um, what neurons in the brain are trying to calculate. Sure. Um, I think in in some human experiments, so that that manipulation of of the intertrial interval <clears throat> is one of the things that they they do kind of explicitly so uh, they explicitly use in order to try and push people's speed accuracy trade offs around as well. So sometimes you right. can, you can just by by changing it from being a, a very short e ITI to a much longer ITI, then generally people will, will become much more cautious in their decision making when they know that there's going to be a longer time to wait until the next trial. So it's it's quite a nice just kind of like an empirical right. thing, even, even right. if they're not doing it in an optimal way. Then, um, but, but to answer the, the question in a bigger way, there is a, I mean, 50 year, maybe more literature on this, right? I mean, it's an extensive literature that is like kind of like a bottomless pit. <laughs> I, I guess I was thinking that the human literature, the human uh, um, experiments might be uh, even more well suited to this question because 
you could defer all the rewards to the end, right? Rather than usually in the, in the monkey, you give reward every trial. And so there is then an urgency to getting the trial done. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you just wait until you get your payoff at the end of the day, then anyway, we're probably a little far in the weeds here. Um, so um, let's see, Eddie asked a question. Um, uh, the, the HMM is an online algorithm. Is it possible for, to have an off, offline algorithm that outperforms the HMM? I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the, what the term outperforms means, but one of the things that Pascal and I had to um, limit in our um, materials today that I actually wanted to share with you because I yeah. think it's really a lot of fun is, um, is uh, how you fit these models to data. Um, rather than just how you do inference on them. Um, and it's already maybe, too much. It's already too much, Sean. What's that? That's already too much? The feedback is it was already way too much. Oh, no, no. Yeah, that is true. The, uh, the, the materials were way too much. But I'll just mention that um, uh, when we do the inference algorithms we talked about today, they, 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 they're causal, right? They only take the, the data you've seen so far and let you make your best guess as to whatever the hidden state is. Um, but if you know the future, then you can do even better. And that's uh, kind of how the inference algorithm, sorry, how the, the, the fitting algorithms work, how you can um, fit the parameters with maximum likelihood. So you do a, a causal pass, the forward pass, and then you do a, mm -hmm. a backward pass that takes into account all the data. And once you've done that, then you can infer the parameters with um, a, a high, um, you know, high, higher degree of, of, of certainty. Um, but I mean, but just to be clear, Sean, that is, that is a very important philosophical point, which is why we're having this session today, right? I mean, like how much worse do you do if you have to make the decisions in real time? You, you can't wait, as several panelists have already said, until you have all the data, then it's too late. And someone else will have already made the decision and will outperform you, right? So, so yeah, an offline algorithm that waits until all the data is in will outperform an online algorithm but in real life, they will have been e eaten by the honor algorithm. They'll be eaten by a tiger. In the yeah, yeah. I mean, this is brutal. And you're all here making decisions because your ancestors survived that and they made decisions early. Oops. All right. Um, okay. Uh, let, maybe we'll go with the, the top question here. Can we artificially... Um, uh, via TMS or uh, TES and, in, and individually improve our performance on reinforcement learning tasks? This is, this is way outside my wheelhouse. I don't know if any of you guys have, a, have a ideas here. Um, I mean, I would be very surprised. Uh, I, I know there's reports of this stuff, like electrically or magnetic stimulating to improve like intelligence and like that. But if you look at this more closely, I think there was a recent review that showed this was mostly, and I don't be controversial, mostly false positives. And from a, from a, from a um, underpowered studies, things like that. But from a um, principled perspective, I would be very surprised because again, the spatial and temporal resolution is usually not sufficient to, to um, improve anything. It's usually good to like degrade performance. Let's say if you deliver a TMS pulse, just the right time when a, when a visual image comes into your visual cortex, you can make people temporarily blind. Improving it, I'd be very surprised, uh, reliably, if, uh, statistically reliably, unless you believe that, say, something like the parietal cortex impedes decision making as, as a whole, which it could, but I doubt it. So, so th this <clears throat> this is a uh, a topic which I guess you'll you'll hear more about in a couple of days' time when when you, you come onto the reinforcement learning. So. Um, but uh, but, but uh, the two-step task of those of, of you who don't know it is, is a way of trying to discriminate these two forms of, of decision making. Uh, model three, where you're just learning by trial and error from the environment and model based, where you have um, an implicit uh, model of, of, of your environment and, um, uh, and, and you, you, you use that model of the environment in order to update your, your actions in the future. Um, there, there, there have been some studies which, which have tried to use uh, TMS to modulate. So, so, so the, the question is often not like about optimal performance per se, but it's about the degree to which you use a model based versus a model three strategy um, in, uh, in, in solving this task. And you can uh, look at that in terms of the degree to which uh, the feedback on one trial influences the choices that subjects make on, on the subsequent trial. Um, there have been a few studies which, which have claimed 
um, changes in performance. And it's not really about, um, as, as Pascal was saying, like, you, but you're, you're going to get better by, by stimulating people. Um, it's, it's that um, you, you, you have a change in the, the ratio of, of model based versus model three. So one report for the person who asked the question that, that I was, uh, was, that, uh, was from Peter Smith and R in, in Ray Dolan's lab, that if you stimulate the DLPFC with uh, transcranial mag magnetic stimulation, then it tends to lower the degree of, I think, model-based performance and tends to um, upregulate the amount of model three. But that does, of course, come with the caveats that, that Pascal came, uh, pointed out that, that um, there, there are uh, certainly many issues to, 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 that have been raised as, as to whether um, a lot of these effects are, are really robust and, and replicable. But on the other hand, the nice thing about TMS is it's, it's reasonably cheap and easy to go and oh. pre-register your study, study and, and go and try and reproduce it yourself. So, you know. Uh, Lawrence, out of curiosity, do you know if any of them have been replicated successfully? <laughs> um, so certainly uh, you can definitely, you, you, you can get very uh, reliable and reproducible effects over basic sensory motor um, tasks in, in yeah, yeah, no, tech. So, no, so I'm, modulation I'm, of things like, of, of, of like motor evoke potentials, um, so but I, I, I wanted to, to preface the, the answer with, with that, basically just to say um, uh, that you shouldn't say that, that TMS or, or, or TMS no, 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 is, no, is like no, a... Not um, at all, no. no. I mean, specifically yeah. in the past that the, that the questioner asked. No, no, exactly. exactly. No, I, I, it hasn't been replicated in that. And I think a lot of the cognitive effects, I, right. I don't see many replications of, of, of those yeah. really. So, so I, I, I treat them with deep skepticism as well. And just, just to reference Lawrence, yes, all the basic sensory motor stuff is extremely replicable. Uh, you know, finger twitches, uh, seeing things, phosphenes, all that. But the cognitive stuff is pretty controversial, I would say. But, but, for, but for methodological reasons, not even conceptual. I think that's fair, right? Yeah. yeah. People have been... Uh... People have been suggesting there are two separate systems in the brain actually in charge of model-based versus model-free system. I, uh, so, uh, so for example, in rats, people are saying that uh, that in uh, in rats, basal ganglia striatum, uh, uh, I think it's a dorsal medial striatum is in charge of. Uh, uh, well, I forgot which is which, but when is a dorsal lateral, when is a dorsal medium, uh, and uh, and uh, and this, and you can do vision in one system uh, to suppress model-based behavior, or or in the other area to suppress model-free behavior. So, so I guess in terms of shifting the balance between model-based and model-free, that's possible by doing some kind of disturbation. Uh, um, in one of the system and uh, and through that you might get an enhanced performance in tests like two-step tests so so i think theoretically it might be doable um in this particular case but i agree in general when you come to things like uh, uh like related to cognition it's very hard to um to use single things like tms to 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 uh, to enhance your performance instead of uh, instead of just perturbing your performance. I mean, think about it. You're basically hitting the brain with a magnetic hammer. It's very, yeah. unspecific. it's very unspecific. So perturbing, yes. Enhancing, if that worked, I mean, that would be quite, that would imply some interesting things about how the brain works, but it's not impossible. Um, all right, let's uh, move on to the question here. Um, so uh, can you guys see me? I appear to be frozen. No, okay. Um, you're back, you're back. Okay. So uh, in today's tutorial, we defined time fixed decisions and threshold based decisions. These are all deterministic decision rules. Can we talk mm -hmm. more about probabilistic decisions uh, like uh, using a softmax uh, in value based mm -hmm. decisions or some other Bayesian decision rule? Um, so I would say that when people have applied these kinds of models to, to value-based decision-making, um, there's, well, first of all, it, it seems a bit surprising that you apply a, a model like this to a value-based decision task, um, when you first look at it, because you think, well, in a value-based decision task, there's nothing really to integrate. You have all of the information that's presented to you 
um, on, on, on screen directly. Like why is a DDM a good model to, to use here? Um, but, uh, but as in perceptual decision makings, there is um, uh, there would be same set of sets of effects where um, for more difficult decisions, like whether values are closer, you get um, a shift in, in reaction times that tends to, to go later in, into the decision. So you, you get like, uh, you, it's, it, you become much, much slower. And so in order to capture that um, effect of, uh, of, of not only like um, choice, but also um, uh, reaction time distributions and people often use drift diffusion models. Um, the noise in those uh, evidence accumulation is is not really like experimenter driven noise in the same way that that it is considered to be in in perceptual tasks. It's more like well, there's there's noise in in your representations of value that you're sampling uh, over over time, uh, and so there's kind of like an Im implicit noise that that, 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 you're, that you're assuming feeds into the, the drift diffusion model. And so as a result of that, it means that. Um, the, uh, the choices that the, the drift diffusion model is going to make in a value-based decision-making make, task are going to end up being probabilistic. Um, the, 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 uh, in, in more difficult, difficult decisions where the value difference is smaller, your drift rate will be lower, and so noise will tend to um, push you towards the, 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 the things which will tend to have led you to reach the decision bounds will tend to have been more noise rather than the value. And so on, on average, your choices are gonna be less um, deterministic as a function of, of a value difference. Whereas when the value difference is higher, your drift rate is gonna be steeper, you're gonna make faster decisions and those decisions are also gonna be deterministic. So the softmax decision rule kind of falls out of, of, of the, the, the drift diffusion model for, for these, these kinds of decisions, I would say. You want to do the next one? Yeah, um, so I, I like this question. I think it's interesting. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at uh, uh, Le Leandro's question. Um, so uh, can we think of examples in which we'd use the HMM versus the common filter? Um, so where you would expect that a discrete or a continuous state dynamics would be more, more accurate over the other. Um, so what do, you, what do you guys think about that? So I so I can I can uh, um, uh, give it a first pass. I mean, really, the whether you would want to have continuous state dynamics or discrete state dynamics are going to be very um, much dependent on the task that you're involved in, right? So, uh, um, for example, if you're a predator and you're tracking some prey and the prey comes in and out of view, the instantaneous position of the prey is continuous and you would want to track that um, with the, in, in, your, in your mind with some continuous dynamics of what that prey's behavior is. Um, whereas if you're making a decision A or B in some setting um, and you don't know which, which is the correct one and you're accumulating evidence, you have some beliefs, then A or B makes sense and you could have these, um, and, then, and, whether, and if that switches, if sometimes it's A, sometimes it's B, then you might have these switching state dynamics that are, that are discrete. Um, and so I think that the, the, the question that sort of pops, so I, th so I think that the one answer to this uh, question is that there's going to be many different settings that are just appropriate depending on the task. But I think another question that comes to mind for me is what about, you know, brain implementation? Do we, do we, do we have any, any sense of, of the, the brain as um, modeling state dynamic continuous or discrete state dynamics in the world um and i wonder if you guys have any um any opinions yes. on that uh if, if you don't mind me jumping in there's actually a a uh, follow-up by leandro in the in the comments and uh maybe i, I will comment on that uh, so in, in in engineering uh the kalman filter is often used to track movement of things in space so i don't know cruise missiles the apollo mission things like that uh, we use it more or less to track the movement of like the brain in state space as a function of the task. But I actually like the example that uh, Sean used in his lecture. Uh, he opened with that. 
some things are just inherently discrete. So for instance, inferring sleep states from uh, the EEG, that is a discrete task. The Rechtschaffen and Kales criteria, there's four defined sleep states, five if you add REM. And so that's an dis inherently discrete task. So I think it depends on the task, maybe like Sean already said. If you want to track some movement of some, some, sp some brain in some state space, yes, that, that use the common filter, right? Maybe I, I can just give one ex explicit example of a hidden Markov model when used in, in decision making. So quite mm -hmm. often people use these in, uh, in, in tasks where you uh, receive rewarding feedback uh, across time um, and uh, the uh, reward associated with one stimulus and another stimulus reverses at different points during the course of the experiment. There, a hidden Markov model is a really good model for, for, for that because you have feedback on every trial that tells you um, well, yes, this stimulus was awarded or this one wasn't. Um, and then you have these, these hidden states, which are like, well, at some, at some points, um, uh, this one is, uh, is, is more probably likely to be the reward of the other one. Um, uh, and, then, and then at other times, the, those states will, will change. Um, and so that's a very discrete process that occurs on a trial by trial ba uh, basis. And, and then you can use the, the parameters generated from those hidden Markov models just as regressors to analyze your, your fMRI or EEG data and, uh, in those tasks. So it's, it's, it's very heavily used in, in those kind of discrete tasks. I also just wanted to uh, make a shout out for some, some cool in, uh, work that's, that's, that's sort of active areas of research of combining these kinds of models. So um, if you guys remember, we talked about um, in, in, in linear dynamical system, you'd say that x at time t plus one, if x is the hidden state, is given by a times x at, uh, at t, where, where a is some dynamics matrix. Well, imagine that, um, that a switches every once in a while. So you have ongoing continuous dynamics, but then that dynamics itself switches occasionally. So you like substitute in a new A. And so in that way, you can have actually have a hidden Markov model on top of a, um, of a linear dynamical system. And that's called a switching state, a, a, a switching linear dynamical system or a switching state space model. And, uh, and there, there are some interesting, uh, there's some interesting research going on in that. And from my point of view, um, thinking about how the brain works, I think that kind of model makes a lot of sense because um, we may want to employ some set of dynamics in some task, but the task has a microstructure that we need those, those you know, sort of continuous like dynamics for. But when we move to some other task or we're in some other state or we have some other set of goals, then we're in a new setting where we, the microstructure again, is sort of continuous like, but has a very different set of dynamics that's appropriate for it. So I think that um, it's probably very reasonable to think that the brain, uh, brain activity and, and behavior is, is, a, is an ongoing um, se series of switching continuous systems. Um, and uh, so that's you know, just my uh, philosophizing. I, I don't know if anybody wants to make any- no, I, I think you're right. Comments. No, I think you're right. And I think we are starting to recognize that, that that is actually true. You know, up states, down states, attention, no attention, things like that. Of, of course, right? Yeah, I mean, it seems, seems almost tautological, right? So. <laughs> In 2020, yeah. Uh, but I have to point out that, uh, that this model actually, um, actually most of, uh, are, are actually mostly about behavior, right? You are trying to infer what's being used underlying the behavior. It doesn't say anything about about the neural circuitry uh, that's uh, in the brain, um, and uh, and uh, it, and uh, it's totally possible that the model would explain the behavior perfectly. Then, uh, um, then you cannot find any neural correlates. Um, uh, yeah, so that's my comment about this model. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a really really important and good point. Um, so uh, uh, we, we hope that these kinds of models can at least make hypotheses about what you'd see in the brain and then you go and look for them. Right. Yeah. Um, so we have just a couple minutes left. I, uh, um, I want to, um, so we have a question that has four votes, which is to give more examples of applications of HMMs to different behavioral tasks. I don't know if, 
if any of you guys have some other examples at your fingertips that you want to mention. Um, but other, but after that, we'll probably should start wrapping up. I mean, the, the reversal learning task that, that I just mentioned, I, I kind of explicitly push people towards uh, a paper by Tim Behrens in Nature Neuroscience in 2007 as a really nice um, example of, of, of that and um, uh, looking at uh, tracking of states and how, how they change uh, across time. Um, so that would be one. Right. We could probably do the other questions in a couple of words each, right? They're very, they're very short answers. Uh, just very, they're very... Sure, short. sure. You want to you give uh, Medina her, uh, an answer to her question? Sure, sure I'll try. Uh, so let me be clear. This might be an urban legend, but here's what I heard. There was actually a previous nonlinear extension of the Kalman filter uh, that for nonlinear uh, non -non application. It was called the extended Kalman filter. But the people who made the unstended Kalman filter thought that one sucks or smells Okay, so they, they call theirs unscented in rejection of that, but that might be an urban legend. That's what I heard. <laughs> is that, I is not, that urban? What? I did not, I have never heard that, but I, I don't, I mean, it's possibly true. They, they showed that their, their common filter is superior to the, to the, to the, extended, to the extended common filter. Yeah. That's right. the and it is, it, 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 it is. And so they, they called it out because they already had eponyms, piled on eponyms, so they just called it unscented to be cheeky. I don't know, that's what I heard. <laughs> um, so I, Lena asked a question about um, the, some of the methods uh, that, that, are, that are support a lot of the work that we're doing in NMA. And I would point her and anyone else who's asking similar questions to um, some materials we have about that we provided on, on some background um, uh, um, uh, quantitative approaches. Mm -hmm. um, and there, I, I'm sure you guys have the, um, the, the specifics that you got in advance of starting the course. There is certainly more advanced things that are not in there. So uh, some of the things you mentioned here, certainly random matrix theory or you know the different kinds of optimizations. I mean, that's really where you need to get into um, more advanced coursework. Right, um, but, but can't you say in one, one word? Linear algebra. Oh. <laughs> At least uh, I, I feel like I never know enough linear algebra. That's, that's probably most words, wouldn't you say? I mean, machine learning is just linear algebra plus... Uh, um, Computers. Uh, what's that? Oh, yes. Plus, plus, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Linear yeah, algebra. But, but for real though, like uh, I think uh, multivariate statistics is you know, the field now and, and linear algebra tells you how to deal with that, no? I think that's a good way to go. I, that's why I would say. With sprinkles, someone put in the comments. Um, Very fast. Yeah, linear algebra fast with code. What could go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I guess why don't we wrap it up there. Any, any final words from, from each of the three of you guys? No, I mean, I, I would just chime in to say, like, if, if at the moment you're finding that um, that you're kind of in a state of information overload, um, which is kind of understandable given that, that you're you're encountering so much new material, and, uh, and then then I guess, I guess one of the real advantages of of, of something like newer matches is, is that these tutorials, I assume, are going to stay online in perpetuity. Um, and and so you shouldn't see it as like, oh, I've got to try and master everything in, in these three weeks. You should see it as like, try to get yourself familiar with, with the, the core concepts and, and, and do as much of a tutorials as you can. But then when, when it's really going to come and be fruitful is, is when you come and do your, your own research projects in, in your day to day lives. And then you can think, well, OK, now I can go back and really kind of like spend a, a, a few days unpicking that, that HMM tutorial. Um, in, in the way that, that I didn't really feel like I, I quite had time to do in, 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 in Neuromatch. So, so, um, uh, so, so try and take as much of it as you can, but, but don't worry if you feel slightly overwhelmed, I would say, at, at this stage. If I can jump in there, because there, that's a good point. Uh, I want to say two brief things. One is, ironically, perhaps, given what you just learned, we had to make decisions about what to include before we had any, any evidence, any evidence <laughs> of what, what you guys can do. So yeah, we're gonna be off. We have to update our filter, I guess. So next next time we'll have we'll have integrated that and have an, a current state that, that actually works, I think. So thank you for all, for all the feedback. I think I already realized what we can cut out. Just briefly, there's a question by C. Sean, and it's a good good one about the mice and that. It's a good observation that uh, 
higher order quote unquote animals seem to be better at integrating more information and it could be related to um, you know prefrontal cortex size but I want to add uh, or point out an important confound it could just be heart rate if you look at that all these animals are maybe on a just faster clock like the mouse is on a faster clock than the, than the rat the rat than the cat so we should test this with like elephants and whales who have very very uh, low heart rates like 20 beats per minute or something like that in a blue whale or in an elephant. So yeah, so, so I think that's an interesting idea and a good confound that you pointed out. Yes, so I guess I would add one thing to, uh, to today's discussion is that, uh, that I hope we would pay more attention to the big picture, which is what's going on in the brain instead of all the models, uh, technical details of this uh, uh, technical details of the analysis and these things. We have to think about what's possible in the brain, what's biologically realistic, uh, and, uh, and how we can verify this in the brain. Um, so, so, so I guess this comes from the point of view of an experimentalist, but I think um, it's an important issue when we are talking about the models of the brain. Great. Well, um, I think uh, we'll we'll leave it there. Um, I've I've really enjoyed the discussion, and thanks uh, for joining us from around the world. Um, and I hope that all the students uh, enjoyed the, the discussion as well. And um, yeah, you know, so. I, I'm certainly um, uh, uh, available to to take questions if someone you know finds my email address. It's easy to find online, and I I guess I won't speak for our panelists, but um, you can probably find their addresses as well and harass, harass them if you wanted to. Um, and uh, I hope that you guys all enjoy the next week and a half. Indeed. All right, so why don't we end it there? Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.